you know, you start to see that they're, they're really going after our food supply now. So once the food supply is taken away, then where does it come from is the question, but they already have the answer. That's the thing. They plan to centralize it. That's the scariest thing. They already have a plan to try to centralize global food control under one roof of control of one governmental body over one global governance system. We're starting to see a lot of you know, doubling and tripling of food prices, and we're already seeing the problems that it's creating. So can you imagine if it doubles or triples again? I think that's kind of the breaking point. And we're, then we're starting to get really close to what those forecasts were for 2028 and the food insecurity enough to actually topple governments. Welcome to Business Game Changers. I'm Sarah Westall. I have David Dubine coming to the program. He's going to give you a different take on what's going on. And I think it's this is the kind of conversations we need is to look at things from different perspectives. He says that the entire earth is in a cycle and that it helps explain some of the behaviors of our government. Obviously, we have a fiat currency cycle going on in the background too, or the foreground, and it's not really background, and how all these things play together and some of the behaviors even how it ties in with geoengineering and what they're doing, what these other countries are doing. And then he describes the globalist plan to centralize all food production in Africa and move us all into cities and then create pasture, you know, back to nature everywhere else. I mean, these guys are pagans, so that's what they want to do. And then uh, corral us into small cities. And the dumbest thing you could ever do is centralize food production. That is terrible. It is puts us at great risk, the humanity at great risk to do anything that's stupid. You need to have food production as distributed as possible, regardless. I know it's kind of scary, but the more prepared you are, the less scary it is and i i just think you know being prepared and plus this will save you money i mean we the mit index just came that living in a big city went it increased by 40 percent from 2023 to 2024 on what it takes for a single person it went from about 68,000 to 98,000, but 40 percent to live comfortably in a large city so these kind of inflation rates we can't handle and so learning how to grow your own food learning how to be self-sufficient is really important right now okay let's get into this really interesting, to say the least, conversation with David Dubai. Hi, David. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I mean, the realm of people you talk to and some of the information I have, I really believe it could, uh, you know, dovetail into a good conversation of A, explaining why a lot of these things in the world are happening right now, but B, also giving some solutions for what seems like such a dark era it's just a cycle. We've been through it before. We wouldn't have the conversation if our ancestors didn't survive it. So what do we do in the interim? And, you know, the world's going to change around us, but how do we also prepare for this? Well, yeah, okay. Before we get into this, because there people are going to find this really, this conversation really interesting. How did you, you started off back in the day believing in global warming. You were trading coffee, buying coffee. Why did you believe that and why did you change yeah. Until you start buying coffee in Myanmar, a place called Burma, down near the equator, and they're talking about freeze damage on the on the tops of the coffee trees there. That doesn't make sense to me. And then I started to do a little more research, and they were telling me back in their great-grandfather's era, late 1800s into the early 1900s, which we know now is the centennial minimum, which is a very low uh, era of solar, of solar activity or sunspot activity, which cooled and then that made sense to me. And then uh, I started to look for different answers and uh, reaching out to a bunch of people. And I started to realize this thing's a cycle and it's back again. And this is why we're getting some of the upsets and extremes here and there. And uh, that's really what changed it for me was doing my own research and then finding the cyclicity or the cycles of it. And once I understood it was a cycle and it ebbs and flows and it returns, then I was thinking, well, how are governments going to handle this thing that was last in the 1640s? it's back again. So how would you handle this system of governance? And that really sent me on this whole breadcrumb trail to look for the answers. Wow, the Fed's most trusted recession indicator is flashing code red. Every recession since 1945 has been preceded by a yield curve inversion. Meanwhile, the M2 money supply is meaningfully contracting for only the fifth time since 1870. All signs appear to point to a sizable downturn for the Dow, S&P, and NASDAQ. 
Gold prices have been hitting all-time highs and the rally is far from over. Call the Proud Americas of the Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late. And remember, mention the ADAPT 2030 channel. Hey, and Patriot Gold Group has a no-fee-for-life IRA where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold or silver. And the no-fee-for-life IRA on qualifying rollovers. Reach out to Patriot Gold Group, 888-546-7020 for your free investor guide today. And now on with the video. So you believe it's a cycle or the evidence is showing that it's a cycle and that we're back in it. What does it mean to be back in it? And what is how what is the length of these cycles? Well, approximately two solar cycles. So if we're in solar cycle 25 now, as we come off of this, now anybody can do their own research. I highly encourage you to do the research. Don't even believe a thing I say. I'm here to just present some information. And I wish you would double check it, triple check it, and try to disprove me because after you try to do that, the own litmus test, you'll be like, whoa, how did I, how did this escape everybody is more. So when you start to look for these cycles, you know, you come up with some of the space agencies and it's all about sunspot count. So if you look out at the forecast for solar cycle 26 and 27, this comes from officials at NASA and European Space Agency. They're talking about low solar activity that would be something equal to the 1640s called the modern minimum era. And once you start to look out at this and say, wait a minute, what happened during that time? And you realize fingerprints of it are population migration, the complete destruction of the economy and reemergence, and then the way the governments oversee the citizens needed to change also because there was so much famine, uh, incredible hyperinflation in the food price rises, uh, people moved some places emptied out 90, 90%. People had to leave to go to better areas to find food so they wouldn't starve. And then a lot of people died during this time too. Now, some estimates are between 10 and 25% of the global population perished. So I'm thinking, hmm, if this is coming right now, we should start to see massive movements of government, massive shifts in the economy, and a huge movement of supply chains to try to get ready for all these things inbound. Now, the excuses you're seeing out in the news right now of why these events are happening, the same exact ideas are happening, but they're giving you a different excuse because if you knew it was natural, you knew it was coming back, you, your life, you do things differently in your life right now, and I really believe that. Are they trying to protect you or are they just trying to prevent panic? I don't know. So that's why we're here having the conversation. And I don't know if they protect us, really. I think it's more of a, you know, save themselves and let us fend for the scraps up here on the surface on the windshield, if for a better term. <laughs> that's right. They don't, doesn't seem like they care too much about us. But you have a, a show called Adapt 2030. And then you also talk about the, the mini ice age. Now, are they adapt 2030? Do you believe that's the time frame? Because they talk about Agenda 2030 and their new things. Do you think it's tied? Is that what that is a playoff of, of being tied to their, or is that a completely different thing? Their Agenda 2030 is just some dominant thing, control structure versus them knowing about this cycle. Originally, when I started the channel, there was no anything Agenda 2030. It was all back in like Agenda 21 and that sort of thing further back in the day. My whole premise was we have to adjust the food growing strategies on the planet by 2030 for most people to move through this because uh, some of the top minds that were studying uh, different polarities of the sun and magnetic fields on the sun were saying 2028 will be our low period of this point. Now, our government, this is back in 2018, mind you. Mm -hmm. They were saying, you know, we need to start preparing food, stockpiling food, getting ready for the famines that are going to arrive in 2028. Or maybe not famine everywhere, but food insecurity to the point that it will absolutely rock the core of the society and civilization on the planet when your food costs three, five, ten times more. We're starting to see a lot of you know doubling and tripling of food prices, and we're already seeing the problems that it's creating. So can you imagine if it doubles or triples again? I think that's kind of the breaking point and we're, then we're starting to get really close to what those forecasts were for 2028 and the food insecurity enough to actually topple governments across the planet. Well, we're, I just, the MIT index just showed that from 2023 to 2024, there was a 40% increase in, if you're living in a major city, to be able to live from like 68,000 or 67,000 to 90. 
seven, I don't know, 98,000. I can't remember off the top of my head, but 68 to about 98. And from 2023 to 2024 to live comfortably in a major city for one person. That's a massive increase. That's about a 40% increase in one year. Is it, is it really an increase? Okay. I'm saying it's an increase in uh, inflation. I mean, just to live like that, and most of it is food. Right. Is it really the inflation or is it the dollars being devalued and they're just pumping it out so they can continue to buy? And I'm talking about governments on the side of preparation, because during the COVID time, were the shortages really shortages as we understand them? Or was that just a rediversion of what was being produced in a continuity of government into their warehouses, stockpiles and wherever that they you know, assemble these goods to try to continue our system of governance forward? But then at the same time, if you know this grand solar minimum cycles here, and it's on the same exact timeline of collapse of fiat, look at the population migration across the planet. Again, the same thing is happening. And then the governments are restructuring themselves to absolutely suppress your speech. The way they're operating is something that we haven't, we don't even recognize our governments anymore. That's how much it's changed. That's very Same true. thing happened in the 1640s. Same thing happened in the 1200s. And you go back at the beginning, uh, say, the birth of Christ era, right around that time and into 400 AD, that giant shift where, you know, Christianity solidified itself. And then we start looking at these chapters of history again and again and again with these massive changes that occur in government, finance or economy, and then population itself. And we're just repeating, I think we're just repeating what has happened the last six times of this grand solar minimum to say 400 B.C., Nothing new, really, under the sun, except the way it's being handled and the lies we're being fed. Instead of us being told it's a natural cycle so we could prepare for it, we're given all these excuses of why these things are happening. Oh, point fingers to the bad guy over there. Point fingers to the bad economic uh, banks over there. These people are hoarding this. All those people there, they're doing bad things to the supply chain. The blame is everywhere else except where it should be. And that big yellow thing in the sky that's shifting our jet streams and governments know what's happening. And I don't think they're going to come clean with the citizens because it might create too much panic. But that's the reason for everything you're seeing truly across the planet as our lives are just ripped apart at the shreds here. And you can feel it. You can see it. Everybody can. It's different now. Well, what does it mean to, like, what does it practically mean? I mean, April is a weird month. We have all these cosmic things going on. But what does it mean practically? Because if you look back at history, there is a shift at where the where you could grow food well and where the deserts, deserts were, where the water was and where the land was. Uh, you know, continents, not whole continents, but islands are underwater and then they're not underwater. What does it mean? Like, Is that what you're talking about when things shift it is exactly and i sent you a couple of pdfs one of them was uh some research i'd done for some persons who were going to set up farms in arizona and new mexico and i started to take a look at the north american monsoon which shifts on a 4500 year cycle and the shift that would be the mark is what we've seen all these massive floods up in across California and up in Nevada. That's that push. It comes off the Baja Peninsula and starts driving much more moisture up into what right now is considered the driest areas of America. But you go back a few well, 600, 800 years, and we start to see, you know, full cities there that had dried out that they no longer could stay there because there wasn't enough water and the, no water, no crops. And you start to see the hydrological cycle get changed as the jet streams start to move in different flows as the magnetic field on our planet shifts. That's all related to the sun. And then you start to see these ebbs and flows through history. Like, why do we come up to these incredible periods of high everything, technology, mathematics, art, and then we collapse? Yeah. Again and again and again. Like, what, what causes that drive up to... The high points, extra calories so people have enough food in their bellies so they can take care of going on beyond the basics of just having to stay alive to have enough calories to get to the next day to grow more food or just stay alive for more calories. Once you have extra calories, you can begin to solve a lot of problems. If you have the food thing sussed out, you can solve an enormous amount of problems. And then we start to get into this problem solving and it increases as temperatures increase, as fertile lands produce more food, and then something changes at that apex. And we've seen it again and again and again through history. What is it? It's the change of the jet streams and the ability for us to grow food in the same exact areas in these northern latitudes. So I'll give you a, 
This time around is very similar. So you're looking at 45 degrees north latitude and above. Anything at that latitude and above is going to produce less and less and less. And eventually some places in, say, northern Canada where they're growing barley and some kind of wheat is going to go to zero. Right around the United States and the, on the border with Canada is going to be greatly reduced. You start to see the same thing in northern China and Heilongjiang area. And then we look at Russia and the northern uh, areas of Europe going down in production. And now we got Ukraine completely almost offline, maybe 5% they'll produce this year. Kazakhstan, another hot spot, another breadbasket, having problems producing because of the political unrest. So everywhere you look, uh, there's less and less food being produced across the planet. But would you know it? Would that be the excuse that they would tell you? Or are they just going to say it's inflation? Well, I, I think that there's both going on maybe, right? Because we do have a fiat currency that's dying. And then we have the food supply that's in jeopardy. So are you saying, too, that the food supply, we just have to shift where we're growing food and shift what we're doing? Or will there be a period where there will be few places that productively grow food? The shift has already been planned to occur into North Africa in the Middle East. Now, if you start to take a look over there, now this is counterintuitive with the largest hydroelectric dam in Ethiopia. In Africa, it's the largest hydroelectric dam. But then again, you look at Ethiopia and Sudan, those are the driest places in Africa. So why would you put a dam there? And the Chinese did the same thing in the Tarim Basin out there if you're in uh, Xinjiang. And that's some of the driest areas of China. But why would they suddenly start to put the largest hydroelectric, one of the largest, largest hydroelectric dams in Western China in the driest place in China? Well, they know the hydrological cycle's shifting and moving. And the crazy thing was with the new Renaissance Dam, which I'm referencing over in uh, Eritrea and Ethiopia area, they were predicting it would take about seven years for it to fill up. And it only took two because uh, the cyclone cycle's a little bit different. The above ground moisture patterns are changing over Western Africa, and they call it the West African monsoon. And then Qaddafi proved the point of drilling down and getting the water from the Nubian sandstone aquifer, the different aquifers across Northern Africa, the Seuss aquifer that all the way up into Morocco. And if you look, there's, I don't know, thousands, tens of thousands of cubic kilometers of water beneath the surface there of the sand. So if you can combine that, we have to start the new debt cycle over. Like the one we've run, it's run to its course. And this is the collapse. The hyperinflation's coming. The fiat money system, as you know, it is being revamped. The 80-year cycle and the fourth turning, we're at it. Where are you going to restart the debt system at? Well, if you start in Africa and North Africa and the Sahel, and we have to build out an entire new grow zone. And by the way, it's larger than the combined growing area of the United States and Canada combined. If you do the North African Sahel and you swing that over into parts of the Middle East there, there is more growing space and you can double rotate the crop. The thing is, you need to put all the infrastructure in there. The, the well, water the pumps rain, Yeah, the rain needs to come. But you think the natural change in the weather patterns is the rain is going to hit that area. It's going to be more fertile ground. And the the ground like the midwest do you think that because that's a bed bread basket of the midwest or of the united states is that going to lose its fertility maybe not the fertility but the crop yields based on the rainfall patterns or the droughts that come in now it's going to shift over now, the places like arizona new mexico etc with that north american monsoon shifting up there are going to become wetter like you saw a few stories this year like record floods in southern california and that whole burning man thing or got really wet up in there that's what i'm talking about that moisture is being pushed up in that corridor now from down in baja so that's going to be a continuous wetting pattern now will it be that wet every single year probably not it's going to you know like weather does or climate does it's up and down and it's variable naturally but the drought cycle also, we've seen some amazing droughts in these last couple of years across the Midwest grow belt. Uh, sorghum was really hit terribly last year. They were at 100 year lows in production in the panhandle. But you take a look across the planet, where are things being disrupted? China had a terrible crop season because of floods. And then we see a huge amount of extra moisture coming down across the Sahel. And the Chinese are over there farming that. That's why they're building the ports on the East Coast across from Tanzania. They need to export that extra food out to get it back to China. So when you see who there's, who's there first, farming hundreds of square miles already, 
you get the point. Yeah, the proof of concept was there. Gaddafi proved it by drilling underground into the this, uh, this, uh, aquifers that you can grow food using that source of water, primary, and also it's always replenished because if you pull it out of there, the sea around there is going to continue to refill that. But as you pull it out, there's going to be so much. It's really an untapped area of the planet, and we're talking tens of thousands of cubic cubic kilometers of water under the ground there to be utilized. So when you start to say that they've already chosen the place, they're going to abandon other places. So if you abandon food production in other places, again, the viability of the economy in those areas have already been written off. You know, you, you're better at me than I am doing spreadsheets and you own businesses and that sort of thing. And you don't PNL on that. So I can, I need to write off this area here in, in mid Canada or Northern, you know, going up into the, the grow belts in Canada, but I need to now, uh, you know, shift that asset over into, and we need to allocate some funds and get this thing built out. That's the restarting of the debt. Again, after this collapse comes, you need money's just going to move. It's never going to disappear. They've already chosen the spots that this new grow zone area will be set up in. Wow, this is really fascinating. So now, is you you talk in your other shows, and and we talked a little bit beforehand that there's an event. Do you foresee this all just kind of shifting in a very short period of time, or is it something that shifts over many years? Well, in terms of us having a shift, I would ask everybody out there. In the blink of an eye, what you consider from the beginning of COVID until now, how much has your life shifted? Uh, if you say zero, you're very lucky because I really don't know very many people that had zero shift. Now, in those last five years, was that an enormous amount of shift? Because in the next five is when the geophysical changes are really going to start. And then you start to look at this and say, all right, well, I wanted to add one thing that I, I forgot about. Some reports are coming out, and I can't say, is it truly you know, etched in stone? But the idea is to consolidate all that growing area in North Africa, in the Sahel, Middle East, all into one area for the planet. They want to take the rest of the planet offline and have all these like nature zones set up and these different no-go zones and put people in these city areas, take everything else off and do nature restoration for what we consider now, you know, mid-rest grow belts. And they want to bring it back to grassland prairies and they want to do the same in Europe and they want to rewild it with Pleistocene animals as they're doing. And they want to rewild the place. But so whether they're met, if they can take it to the Uber and the pendulum swings as far as they want to go with this project or their ideas is grow food in one consolidated place on the planet and then send it out to the rest of the planet. And whoever controls that grow zone, and if it truly goes there and they can control the world's food supply, grown in one area, originated in one area, shipped from one area, under consolidation of who knows who or what corporations, that's where they want to take it. Now, how quickly could that shift occur? Well, we're about to see a couple things here, in my opinion. Once you your leaders can't even guarantee you food, you kind of run to the end. Like in China, when they say the emperor loses the mandate from heaven, that means when the emperor can no longer provide like food for the populace, that they, they lost the divine right to rule the people. You know, they say they're from the gods and from the dragons, but if they can't feed the people, then they lost the right to rule. That's right. So you start to see this. Yeah, excuse me, I just rambled on that, so go ahead. No, 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 that's right. When you when you can't feed the people, people stop. That's what happened with the French Revolution. They couldn't feed their children, and women actually were the ones that rose up because they were working, and their husband was working, and their children were still dying, and they said, hell with this, and that's why the revolution happened. The women, actually, when you when your babies are dying and you can't feed them, they, they have no fear. So if that's just the standard for what happens in the society when the food reduces to where it gets so expensive that you're literally fighting, working for a day's wage for a loaf of bread, at what point do you give up hope? And at what point enough people do that, that then they know the government will absolutely be overthrown or changed? You know, the United States is such a large place, it would be more regional and states and that sort of thing. But take it out over across the entire planet. I mean, how much civil unrest and strife and people so angry with the governments right now do you see across the planet? It's literally everywhere because of food costs. Now, luckily in America, we we have some of the lowest food costs on the planet. You know, some places in Pakistan, 45, 45% of everything they make goes to food. We're down somewhere around 15. 
one five percent. Oh, it's changing. It's changing. It is. Yeah. You know, we're starting to see it here. Also, people are getting angry at home because the food prices are rising so so fast that it's really they don't have time for entertainment. They should. They don't have money for entertainment. They don't have time because they're working two jobs to pay for the food and the rent and the insurance. And although you just talked about living in the city, I mean, how much? How many extra hours do you need to work to provide forty percent increase in your cost of living? Well, you got to get the heck out of big cities. You got to start living in a smaller town, places where the cost of living isn't so bad. You're closer to the food. But let me ask you, okay, so they're planning on changing where the world supply is and consolidating centralizing it, which I think is a complete mistake. I think food supply should be decentralized as much as possible and grown everywhere, but they want to centralize it. Where did you find this? Is this part of the World Economic Forum? You know how they had the COVID, everything's going to be reset on COVID, and they had the big target back in 2020 or, or 2019 when they did that? Or is it something, other documents that you found? Yeah, and there's a tremendous amount of uh, Middle East, North Africa, MENA documents that intertwine with like uh, the World Bank, the Bank for International Settlements, the investment plans moving forward with central bank digital currencies. The only reason I really stumbled across this was several years ago, they were talking about using a stable coin to be able to pay all the workers that were going to come into this area and the stable coin that had been chosen was circle usdc at that time now i'm sure it could have changed but then they were trying to use algorand and a couple others out there to be able to get the investment in to pay so one equals one it doesn't matter if you're from ghana it doesn't matter if you're from togo it doesn't matter if you're from sudan you go work and you get paid one one equals one and you take it across the planet and this is the whole thing where they were trying to use yellow with the cards to to bring out payment systems across africa because they needed that stability of knowing you're going to get paid and you're not going to get raked over the coals with your exchange rates because if you're going to try to change uh you know something from nigeria up into area tria the exchange rate is going to be horrendous, like a 25%, 30% just to exchange it because nobody wants to touch that. So this is all the things that were being discussed in the documents. And uh, the Bank for International Settlements is very forthcoming with all of the plans that they want to put together with uh, future finance. They just figure nobody's going to read the stuff. And if you go in with the IPCC also with the rewilding projects and the dam removal projects up in Europe, and there's a whole bevy in there. If you get into the dam removal projects, then it dovetails straight into the rewilding projects. And then you start to find this, that they want to take people off the land. They want to rewild the farms. Well, where are all these people going to go? Well, they're going to get forced into the cities. Okay, well, if all the farms close down and are rewilded, then where are they going to grow the food? Yeah, down there in Africa. And it there's a huge amount of documents that overlay on top of each other, but I would encourage everybody out there, start with the MENA documents, M-E-N-A, that's Middle East North African Association. And from there, then you get into the finance dog, and then you can start to get into the, uh, there's in the area of Chad, in Southern Chad, there's already a couple test zones going on that the Chinese are controlling. There's, they're growing a couple hundred square miles of crops down there. And once you start to see uh, how they were laying out the grids with their irrigation systems, putting up the new roads. They were trying to build rail lines. And then you start to, they put a blueprint on what they were going to do with development in there. So it just all leads back to one global governance system. And at this time, it's really, I mean, you, I, say, I agree with you totally that you, you can't grow food in one place and try to distribute it to the rest of the planet. But then when you look at it and they're trying to remove all of our cattle production any kind of meat production. You look up in Oregon with the contained feedlot laws that have just come in. So somebody has got three cows, five sheep, and they have like a concrete pad or they have a gravel, you know, pad or a gravel area out on their farm. They're now considered a contained feedlot and they need to put $100,000 of, you know, uh, infrastructure in there to try to prevent some sorts of runoff. You know, you start to see that they're really going after our food supply now. So once the food supply is taken away, then where does it come from is the question. But they already have the answer. That's the thing. They plan to centralize it. That's the scariest thing. They already have a plan to try to centralize global food control under one roof of control of one governmental body over one global governance system. The yeah, worst isn't it plan insane? I ever heard of is centralizing the food production versus making it as decentralized as humanly possible so that you're protected with whatever happens. These these people never learn. Now, they, do they want to depopulate as well to deal with the new constraints of their system? 
I mean, what is the deal and, and the, the cycle? Well, it's all about carrying capacity again. You know, there's a finite amount of resources at the way we're doing it now. I'm not saying this planet is any way finite at all. Right. We were using magnetic motors and different energy generation systems, right. and we were encouraged to grow our own gardens like we did with Victory Gardens in World War II. I mean, this would be an entirely different world. Yep. Entirely different. So just the constraints we have right now, the way we're doing it right now with the finance system and the debt system and all these things that have locked people in that they just is difficult to escape from because the system is set to lock you in. So you're a perpetual battery or a, you know, a, a debt instrument yourself moving the system down to the next generation and the next generation. Well, you, this is the worst plan I've ever heard about centralizing food development and being, because that's about the worst, the most insecure situation you could possibly create. And then they want to cram you in and then no one has control over their own food or anything. You are completely at the mercy of some idiot that doesn't care about you for your basic survival, which we kind of are at the mercy now, but sure. that would be going to the extreme. Yeah, if you look at it, I mean, how many seed companies and agribusiness companies are really out there that are providing like Archer Daniels, okay, Sargenta, Monsanto? And we were already kind of at that edge anyway, where it's just 100,000 acre farms, 10,000 acre farms are providing your food. That's all GMO. And I mean, for us to grow healthy foods, they, they discourage that. They discourage you from trying to grow your own foods. I think it should be the opposite because they absolutely know the cycles here. And I think I went off point there, but carrying capacity is we grow this much food, however many tons. And if you start to look at the carryover stocks, this is a good one. If you go to the USDA uh, website and you took at the world totals, uh, the, when I originally started doing this, they were like 750, 800 million tons of carryover. Well, now they're down around like 350 million tons of carryover. So I think that I've seen that thing drop 500 million tons in carryover since what, the last 10 years? So just do the math out. At what point do we start to get what we grow is what we get. There's no more carryover stock left. There's nothing in the silos. It's just what we grow is what we get. So that amount of food that's grown on the planet, you get this amount of people who can survive on that. And if that is going to decrease, then the population has to decrease with it. But now be nefarious for a minute. I'm asking everybody to maybe put a different nefarious hat on here in the role play. You know this food supply is decreasing every year because of changes solar activity and these cycles we're going through, magnetic fields changing. How would you reduce the carrying capacity without allowing most of the general populace to know that it's a natural cycle? And keep them in their, you know, complacency, narrow band, and then, you know, inject fear every so often to keep them even more in that tight band. The minute what? you understand it's a natural cycle, you're no longer controllable. Yeah, the depopulation part of it, I can't say if it'll be purposeful, it'll be natural, but whatever. Nature, we've seen massive amounts of animals, butterflies, different insects, and when the optimal conditions for those overpopulation of a species when that disappears, whether it be a drought or a forest fire, whatever comes in, uh, that population crashes or reaches its, you know, it equalizes the capacity of what's there for the population to consume on to the number of mouths to feed, whether it be insect, bird, reptile, human, homo sapien, doesn't matter. You're in that, you're, we're no different, you know, we're an animal too. Yeah, we're yeah. going to follow the same parameters of nature. Nature dictates it. So what are the solutions from your perspective? Yeah, thank you for bringing that up because the only reason I'm telling you everything I did tonight is you need to understand the problem, what's happening and why it's happening. And once you get that kind of clearer in the mind of everything you're seeing around you is a result of this natural cycle ongoing and governments trying to stop as much, stop the damage and keep the populace uninformed and blame all these other excuses on why things are not the way they used to be. So swing it over here. Things used to be, we grew 40% of all the food that we needed in an entire city or in a state in our own backyards. That would be the first step is getting us back to community gardens, teaching kids in school how to grow food, beginning at just the basics, getting, if it's too much work for you, get with your neighbors. And you know, if there's no fences in between your yards, make like a community space in the back of three yards or four yards together where the families come out and have a much larger garden. You have more hands working on it. And then Marjorie, she got some great, um, you know, different classes over there and, and just 
a plethora of information. You can raise your own meat in the backyards. You can do your gardens in the backyards. But that knowledge needs to be right at the front because everybody is always relying on either, you know, cattle or pig. And I think that's all there is for meat source. But then you realize that, you know, if you wanted to, you could do all the birds and the rabbits. And there's all these other things for protein sources that we could do right at home. And then, you know, you start to cut out the dependency on the system. And that's what the system doesn't want is you less dependent on the system. So it's a feedback loop there, too. They need to keep you on the system because the more people that break free and understand, you can produce your own food, your own proteins, your own honey. And once you get enough people doing it, then you're like, well, they just they're starting to break the system. And you think gold and silver is probably what we need to do to protect ourselves from a monetary standpoint? Among other things, but, you know, look back in history, tools, that's a great one to have. Fuel also, mm -hmm. uh, repair parts. And, and when I say tools, I'm talking about gardening tools, but I'm also talking about things like wrenches, screwdrivers, nails, this type of thing. that are going to get much, much, much more expensive. Like I had a, somebody sent me a picture because we used to buy nails and screw in bulk. They had these big bulk containers out there and actually scoop it out and you buy five pounds of nails two pounds of nails, whatever you needed for your project. Those are all empty. And they're like, we don't know. We can't order. We don't know when it's coming back. The only thing for sale now is in the box. And those things are really expensive. So think about all these things that were traded in the past that also could hold value as a physical thing. It's not gold and silver are awesome. They're going to hold and you can trade that and you can get an enormous amount of value out of it. But having the tools to be able to grow the food having repair parts, having knowing how to repair some things, having the, the whole socket sets and all the screwdrivers and all those tools where you could repair machinery itself because you can have machines, you can do much more work. And then having some, you know, what about a rototiller? I mean, these are kind of physical goods that are going to retain value during these times that are also going to save labor. And that in itself is going to be worth something. So think far beyond just the gold and silver, but do a little study in history. I mean, you know, saving feathers, not so much today. Seashells, eh. screwdriver, you know, tools <laughs> like shovels, yeah. uh, rakes, hose. Then you have to really, and then the skill sets too. Another thing that's going to be real, real, real valuable is like boosting up your skill sets in this whole new environment. I and mean, how many of you know how to whittle down a handle to, if your rake handle breaks, I mean, can you go make a new handle for it? That's old school. That's grandma, grandpa kind of age stuff. Well, everybody knew how to do that, but very few do today. Thank you, David.